a, a development agenda for internet governance, it's got to be flexible and adaptable. You've got to be able to evaluate it and change it and move forward as the system moves forward. And then the issues about what, what consists or what's part of this agenda, and this is again where I found myself agreeing a lot with what Henriette was saying, you know, capacity building, we talk a lot about capacity building, um, and there's a lot of capacity building, whether it's, um, you know, the great work that uh, Raul was mentioning in LACNIC, the work that you guys are doing in your various um, institutions, the work, some of the work that you're doing here in the IGF, like some of what ICANN's doing in the ITU, OECD has development aspects of it. I mean, everybody does capacity building, but it's hard to actually find it. You know, even from my perspective, if I had to, I, I quite often get um, students that come in that are writing research papers in the local universities in town, and I give us a call, and I'm like, I'm happy to talk to people and give them some advice, and they're like, well, how do I find these things? There is no one-stop shopping place for some of this information. So, it, you know, let alone if you're a student in Washington trying to write a paper, if you're an individual in a developing country and you're trying to actually build something or create something or move forward with something, where do you go? So I think... Um, this gets to sort of where I think the role of the IGF and where this particular dialogue that you are, to, are put forward the last couple of years, Bill, could be helpful, is that if you look at what's happening in the various institutions, whether it be ITU or ICANN or everyone's various national endeavors, and you put together some kind of best practices, you can discuss that here and you can provide that here. And you can say, here's a good place where you can, and whether it's a dynamic coalition or the variety of things that you can create in the IGF, and you can probably create a new term and a new phrase, because everyone here seems to be great at doing that. I don't know. Um, but, but that would be good. And I think um, I've sort of been struck uh, at the impact um, the re these regional and national IGFs have had. And actually, I've taken away, and I, I actually, after every meeting I go to, and actually every conversation I have, I have this running list of things to do that I put on my BlackBerry that is always a draft. And one of the things that I've added after this meeting is the fact that maybe in the United States we should even look at doing a national IGF, which could be surprising for a lot of folks here, but it would help us focus as well. Um, we do have a lot of divides in the United States, um, rural and, and, and uh, um, urban, within different states. Um, and so it's it's something that we really would, would take back as, as an interesting model, and I think it would be something that would be really useful to encourage these ideas of national and regional IGFs. But it's also a way possibly to get to some of the issues that you guys raised, which is how do you get the private sector and civil society from your home countries to participate? And one of the ways to do that is to, one, build awareness locally, and two, to galvanize them. And it's hard to do that if you focus once a year every November or December for whatever meeting we're going to next year in Cairo or Egypt, and then the year after that in Lithuania. If this is a once a year thing, it's hard to keep keep momentum going, and so I think these ideas of regional and uh, national IGF could really be useful to sort of help do that. But that was sort of the remarks I wanted to make. Thank you very much, Fiona. You came in under time, so <laughs> you, you are uh, very efficient in your allocations. Um, okay, then I will stop my talk. Um, okay, excellent. So we've had um, five very interesting presentations on different dimensions of the developmental challenges. I think the, what we've heard from everybody is uh, as an overarching point that uh, there needs to be a space for discussion about this and that it isn't happening enough yet in the IGF and so we need to find a way to make development much more mainstreamed into the discussion of all these topics as we go forward. Um, let me just ask um, those of you who have not um, identified particular Internet governance, substantive internet governance issues, uh, whether it's uh, uh, IPv6 domain names, uh, new TTLDs, internet connection costs, so on. Does it, what would, well, let me ask everybody just to name, what do they, if you could name just one issue that uh, if I had to think about how to start building uh, the argument for what substantively a development and agenda might uh, address. What would be your top priority issue in terms of its impact on development and the, in, in particular if it's an issue where there's a need for change in the existing direction of internet governance policy? What would you say your one top issue would be? Just very quickly, Vitor, if you could tell me what you think. Well, if I had to choose one topic, it would be access. Even though, because even because access would be uh, the problem that one soul would, would allow people to have the other problems that the, the internet can offer. So, uh, access uh, for sure, and of course, uh, access, uh, some quality of access, um, broadband. This would be perhaps topic number one. Thank you. 
Can I just ask for clarification? When we talk about access as an internet governance issue, I mean, when we talk about internet governance, we're talking about internationally shared rule systems and so on. Um, there are internationally shared rules on access with regard to the access of competing carriers to the public telecom operators network and so on. These would be under the WTO. Um, when it comes to the, the access of citizens mm -hmm. to uh, networks and so on, we don't really have an international framework of any sort. So uh, when we talk about this from the standpoint of global internet governance, are you suggesting that there should be such a framework, or are you suggesting that the, the fundamentally key governance issue is actually a national and regional issue? Um, well, uh, I think uh, there, it should be dealt with in, in, in several levels. I mean, in, 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 in the domestic level, um, internet exchange points are, are, are a good solution. We, in Brazil, uh, I think we could improve uh, we could help reduce interna international connection costs through uh, uh, the solution in the country, but uh, we, we, of course, we, we, we really lack um, international arrangements to, to, to deal with the, with this. Um, um, I, I'm so. Um, I didn't mean to be too brain teasing. I was just curious. Sir, uh, just curious how. Yeah. Okay. What, what you meant by that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, well, can I just quickly react sure. to, the, uh, to, to the example of IXPs? Um, at the moment, th there is no international arrangement for IXPs. And there's been several cases where internet service providers, I'm talking about in the past, tried to set up a regional IXP, because an IXP, an internet exchange point, doesn't have to be national. And national regulatory frameworks prevented them. So a global agreement about IXPs could enable more effective implementation at a cross-regional national level. Thank you, Bill. I totally agree with Victor that access is the main issue, especially for a region like Latin America, with so big asymmetries in between different social and regional um, areas. I also agree with Henriette that uh, exchange points is a, is a relevant issue, uh, especially for our region. If you consider our countries, it's cheaper to connect from Buenos Aires to Miami than to connect from Buenos Aires to Lima or to Chile. It's silly, but it's, it works like that. Um, what I have no, also noticed about the, the, the concept of access is that there's a, a kind of confusion that the worst part of access is the last mile. Mm -hmm. And it is not like that. I, I have a technical background, and if you want, I can tell you about this in, 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 in the coffee. Um, now, with wireless uh, technologies, especially in rural areas, the last mile is the easiest part because it's for free. It's uh, you have Wi-Fi, excellent technology to connect people for free, and also some countries are giving away WiMAX technology for connecting. So you don't have to build um, external cables, or you don't have, you don't need to uh, install more than one or two antennas to cover an interesting amount of people covered by that, uh, by that service. The big problem of countries like uh, developing countries, especially big countries like uh, Argentina and Brazil and Chile, is the national backbone. The national backbone is more costly than the international connection. Uh, if you want to build an ISP in, say, in the north of Argentina or in the west where I come from, in the small town in the west in Mendoza, it's my homeland, um, well, you have to pay for the national backbone in US dollars, which is higher priced than what an ISP in Buenos Aires has to pay for a good amount of bandwidth to the United States to connect to the international backbone. So I see this is the real challenge for access, which is the cost of the international uh, of the national backbone, especially going to places where there is not a lot of fiber already installed, which is rural areas, semi-rural areas, north or south, away from the capital cities. Thank you. Fiona, are you on the access bandwagon, or is there another issue you think is really? Well, I think 
I wouldn't necessarily term it as access, but I think it's the same issue actually, because I think you can well you can talk about internet governance and what does internet governance actually mean. We could you have that long discussion again, but if you look at all the different issues that are there, privacy, security, they're all about use of networks. And if you don't have the networks, which is an access issue, then how do you actually have these other discussions? So this is why access or infrastructure development naturally becomes a, a key issue when you say what's your first issue. But it's interesting because I think. There's a, there's a slight twist to what you're all saying. It's not just infrastructure development and access. It's a domestic policy and regulatory environment or a regional environment that lets you build these networks, and which is slightly, it's access. It's all about access at some point, but there are different ways to look at it. So development starts at home. Um, surprise uh, um, resolution of the workshop. Um, did, uh, you, did you want to add something before I turn to the audience? Yeah, I guess. A very quick reaction on that. As someone who's been working in this for a long time, it seems to me that, that there's been, I agree with what Fiona said, the national policy and regulatory environment is essential. And I've seen since the WISIS a shift away from emphasis on that and a shift towards a more un complex or approach to, to markets and to, to, to uh, implying that, that increased investment is as if we achieved a certain degree of liberalization. We, don't still, we still don't have really competitive environments. And suddenly, there's less talk about policy and regulation. And I think the IGF really needs to focus on policy and regulation, not just year after year, but for the next 10 years. Thank you very much, Henriette. Uh, we're going to go to uh, questions now, and uh, we can go a little bit over time because it's the last session. Um, so if you have questions, I certainly would encourage you uh, to stand up and share them with us, and of course, ask, give us your name first. Before I go to the audience, let me take an online question. Uh, this is from, uh, good to know that we have an audience out there in Cyberland. This is from Mike Nelson at Georgetown University. Probably many of you know Mike. Um, he asks the following. When most people hear the term internet governance, they usually think about top-down models of governance. I would disagree with Mike, but anyway. Um, but most of the evolution of the internet has been driven from the, the bottom up by developers who create new applications, by standard developers, by users who vote with their mouse, etc. How can we enable developing country users to more effectively vote with their mouse and use social media to make their voices heard? How can the voices of those without a mouse input into online discussions? Anybody like to uh, tackle that question? The, the bottom-up uh, challenges of the, the disconnected and so on? Henriette. Perhaps we've covered it already. I think infrastructure is, is one. Broadband infrastructure, infrastructure that's conducive to, to, to user generated content is, is important. Capacity building is important. I think using the potential of mobile um, for citizens to interact with the state and with one another, to mobilize and to protest, I think that's very important. And then, um, and then I think that, um, uh, well, I think the rights environment, I mean, no, no matter what level of access you have, whether it's limited or extensive, unless you have a f freedom of expression and a culture where express, expressing and speaking up for yourselves is legitimate, the use of the technology will be insufficient or not conducive to bottom-up um, processes. Anybody else like to take that on or should I go to the floor? Um. Okay, all good? Yes, I would like to add something I agree with Henriette. And, and the access that people should have, it should be enough to, to go through the various applications that we would allow them to express themselves because sometimes a, a, not a good broadband uh, connection is enough. Sometimes it's just, you just can't load many applications. So that could be important for people to access. And also you have to let the people know what they will do with that and train them. So capacity building. Um, this is why I think um, schools and public libraries and all other institutions, uh, community institutions have a relevant role, not only access but then helping people know what to do and how to do it if they really are free to, to say what they want to say. Great, thank you very much. Um, any questions from the floor on any dimension of what we've talked about, um, whether 
sort of cross-cutting questions about uh, the notion of a development agenda, or institutional dimensions, uh, way to, ways to do information sharing, et cetera, or particular vertical issues important to development. Uh, we're open to any and all uh, comers. Does anybody have any questions? Or is everybody very tired at this time, uh, this far into the conference? Here we go. Mikhail? Yes, thank you. I'm Mikhail Fluerbom from the University of Southern Denmark. <clears throat> and I have a question about the institutional aspect. Could you, as a panel, maybe some of you will be more inclined to uh, talk about this, could you reflect on some of the obstacles, some of the opportunities for collaboration with the broad development community in the UN, the broader ICT governance um, community? I mean, if you look back in the history of the UN ICT task force, they tried to, to do something like this, to actually become a place where um, different concerns could be addressed, and that didn't work out for different reasons. Um, what, are the some, what are some of the sort of obstacles, opportunities for collaboration? The paradigm gap between development people and uh, internet governance people and so on. Um, how can we tackle that? Who has some ideas? Vitor, anything on that? <coughs> um, um. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm not sure I, 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 I put the, the point you, you mentioned. I'm sorry, could you please? The, the, uh, the gap between the people who work in the, develop, the mainstream development world mm -hmm. um, and the, I, there's also this sort of ICT for D type world and then there's the internet governance world. We have a kind of fragmented scenario yes. where different clusters of people with different types of expertise oh, yeah, and yeah, different yeah. paradigms and ways of doing things yeah. are ha having non-connecting conversations and therefore yes. something like IG uh, for D falls between the cracks. Uh, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, th that's an, an interesting point because um, uh, to my understanding, uh, what uh, Tunisia's, uh, Tunisia's agenda attributed uh, roles for the, the United Nations, coordinating roles for the United Nations in, in, in both fields, in ICT for development and in internet governance, which was uh, 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 what was done in, in case of uh, internet governance uh, through a mandate for the United Nations Secretary General to call a process towards enhanced cooperation for internet governance. Um, so um, these are two uh, parallel but very complementary aspects of uh, development in the, the IT sector. Um, the what, uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is, I, I think, one of the, the uh, uh, main, weak, uh, main weaknesses of the, uh, uh, the uh, internet governance for, uh, uh, for, uh, for must be, this is one of the uh, points uh, in terms of internet governance that should be improved. Uh, one of, uh, I, we are lacking today a locus for a uh, internet uh, governance, uh, an internet development agenda, uh, because uh, as we we all we all, um, uh, um, we all um, have identified here, there are too many institutions we dealing with very uh, specific points of internet governance, and the dialogue between them is not. Um, well established. So I think, I do think the United Nations have a role in, in this process, which is coordinating the efforts of all institutions uh, in order to adapt uh, the uh, Tunis agenda and uh, WIS's principles uh, in, in uh, building a, a development uh, uh, centered, uh, people centered, development oriented uh, internet. Um, uh, governance, uh, multi-stakeholder, uh, multilateral, democratic, and inclusive. So uh, uh, I do think uh, it, it's important that, that uh, the United Nations uh, take the role of uh, coordinating, of calling all uh, institutions to say what they're doing uh, in order to enable development. I think uh, some steps in this uh, in this direction have been taken with a, a consultation that was. Uh, referred to by the UN representative in, in this morning during the dialogue on enhanced cooperation. 
but I think we, we must take action after this uh, first diagnostic. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vitor. Uh, Fiona has something on this point, too. Sure. I'm going to answer the question uh, from a slightly different perspective. I think um, it's important, I mean, you're the one example you raised with is the UNICT task force, and it's important to keep in mind that that was sort of derivative of the DOT force, which came from the G8. And what you had then was you had political will, you had private sector commitment, and you had civil society commitment. And as the time went on, and it went from the DOT force to the UNICT task force to the Global Alliance, I think is what it's called now. It's the same sort of construct, the same organization, but that political will, whether it's governments as a political will or industry political will or civil society, has waned. And I think the, what you need is you need commitment from all aspects to do it. And until you have that, you don't, you won't have it. I mean, it's the reason why the IGF, which I mean, UNICT task force is relatively unfunded. Right? I mean, it's a global alliance, and so is the Internet Governance Forum. And Marcus and others have done a lot to raise money and do things because people are committed. So it, it, it requires this, this, this I'll, I'll refer to it as political will, but political being wherever you are in that space, but political will is what's needed for it to work. Thank you. It's my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that to, to integrate development and IG and ICT, you need four things which human beings and institutions populated by human beings are very bad at. You need to be holistic, you need to be long term, you need to collaborate, and you need to have an integrated approach. And, and I have just really, I've been doing this work since 1987, and I just don't see those principles apply. People move from one solution to the next, one institutional framework to another, one collaborative fr framework to another, and never give them a chance to work. And, and I think uh, Fiona's point about commitment, about will, but it's, it's just not in the nature of either governments or, or even civil society institutions, never mind business, to operate in this manner. And I think the fun, in terms of development, I think the aid community, I think the way in which um, financing of development and finding, financing of ICT in development has operated has not been helpful. OK. Uh, Olga, did you have anything, or should I go to the? Just a brief comment. I totally agree with, with Henriette. Uh, what I have noticed through this uh, internet governance process and what I have heard in many meetings that I go is internet governance is not ICT for D. Could you please tell me what is internet governance for the developing country? I mean, it's for D. It's, it's, we need to develop. So I, I don't understand that difference. Okay. Existential question for us all. Uh, the, the next, uh, yes gentleman back there. Is that uh, Milwaukee? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Milwaukee Chongo of Syracuse University. All right. Um, well, the question of uh, uh, the, the topic of this uh, roundtable uh, workshop uh, is a tricky one because uh, the access problem, for example, that you all have uh, agreed on the problem is, I mean, I agree with you that people need access, and uh, as far as there are a lot of people who don't have access, this problem needs to be addressed. And uh, as long as there is a way to uh, come up with framework at global level, as Henriette said, that will enable the government and the local players to uh, advance access locally, that might be uh, relevant for internet governance uh, uh, agenda. But the trouble with uh, that kind of approach is that I'm afraid it takes uh, the developing country and developing people as uh, potential consumers. It's all about assisting them to be part of it and to become, I'm afraid, consumers. But we need to take the uh, issue of development at all levels. That means also we need to make sure that there is equal opportunity at all level, including at the level of doing business. For example, the registry, the gentleman from Brazil mentioned that at the registry level, there is zero, not only there is zero uh, uh, operators, G G GTLD operator, there is zero opportunity. 
ICANN has released, it's uh, uh, not yet released, but it has been put uh, uh, online for public comments, the new GTLD uh, policy, including IDN. If you go through that process, by the end, you, by, the, by the time you are done with your application and your application gets accepted, you may have spent one million dollars. There's no way uh, a developing country operator can will apply and, and succeed in that. So we need also to approach this question, uh, not only to make them become consumers, but to give them opportunity. Because development issue is a local, is an internal issue, which means it's internal dynamic. You need to give opportunity to people to consume, but also to do business for it to work. Now I have just one question that I take away from the whole uh, discussion on this, I mean during this IGF, because it's not only uh, this uh, workshop. The question that I have c come to discover as the main question, for me at least, is, is it possible to have a global governance body, a legitimate global governance body that operates mainly on, on the basis of um, private contract regime because as soon as you have a private body like ICANN operating through private contract regime, they need to cover their, their back. They need to do business with their business part partners in their economical environment. Is it possible to, to do business that way and to be legitimate global governance body? Thank you. Thank you very much. Three very provocative questions in there. One about access, which we've already talked a lot about, the, the last point, which I won't bother repeating. The, and then the, in the middle, there was a very interesting point, I think. Uh, the new uh, GTD, uh, GTLD, why am I not able to say that correctly? Uh, I'm on the GNSO, I should be able to say it. Um, policy. Uh, this is precisely, isn't this a good example? I, if development considerations were an endogenous feature of the decision-making process, would the pricing policy necessarily be what it is? It's a, it's a fair question to ask. Um, I'd be interested in responses to any of those particular, those three questions, but particularly the, the ones other than access. Um, anybody like to tackle them? Uh, Vitor, you look like you're ready to pounce. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, well, congratulations for your questions. Uh, very very appropriate, I think. Uh, yes, when, when, when I mentioned that, our, uh, the, that the market share of developing countries in, in the GTLE registry market is 0%, I, I, I didn't really mention that, um, uh, that if the, 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 the rules for GTLDs that has been proposed in the, the present draft uh, proposed by ICANN are, are kept. Then the pro the, 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 it's very unlikely that developing countries will get a market share or a significant drop market share in this particular field. And I totally agree with you. And when I answered that access is something important, um, uh, I, I really, I, I really have this, this fear you, you presented here that uh, please don't look at the developing world as if it could be nothing but a consumer of products and services offered uh, from the developed world to us. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the case here is really to, to enable the developing uh, world to, to uh, have a, a role in the development of the Internet, to, to innovate in the Internet, and to, to make money out of the Internet as the developed world does. Um, this is something that is, is really uh, out of the picture uh, today. Um, and uh, w w uh, another uh, interesting point is this, uh, referring to the, 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 the private nature of the, the contracts under the, the uh, ICANN system. Uh, it's, it's really a, a, a matter of concern for uh, other governments, for the, government, the Brazilian government that I represent, that uh, the model of internationalization that has been proposed for ICANN uh, does not sufficiently address uh, the, 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 the global needs because, as, as we know, all the contracts that will be signed uh, by, uh, by ICANN and, and other private entities will be 
um, subject to the California courts and, and not to, to, to global courts in any sense. So uh, and, and ultimately, uh, uh, the uh, so said global uh, global uh, internet market, um, uh, internet domain names market will be um, under a Californian uh, legislation and uh, global legislation. This is really uh, something that should be uh, developed in, in the uh, transaction action plan. Uh, thank you. Um, I think Fiona might like to reply to this. Sure, of course. So now I can put it back on my official U.S. government hat for this type of discussion, I guess. Um, I think it's great that you have read the, the uh, breadth of documents that ICANN's produced on this issue because it's quite large. Um, you know, it's been a lot to read. And uh, I would encourage you and I would actually ask if you're planning on filing comments in the process, to both to the government of Brazil and to the gentleman from Syracuse University that raised the issue, the U.S. government will be filing comments. Mm -hmm. um, and so I encourage you all to do the same. Um, I'll just I'll respond to the to the question about about ICANN. I think it is problematic, um, but there there are global governance agreements and institutional frameworks that exist in the public sector that are also not fair and accountable and accessible. So I think the departure point should should really be public policy principles of transparency, accountability, access, participation. And then the governance system needs to be built on those on, on, on those principles and they need to be implemented in a meaningful way. And that's a challenge for 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 um, for private and for public. And I think the reality is that we we increasingly working with a mix of ownership and of control um, of different configurations. Um, but that should not be an excuse for, for public interest and rights and accountabilities not being respected. So I'm not saying that that's not a challenge, but I think that starting at the top is not going to fix the problem. You have to start at the bottom with the basic principles. Is there one last question from anybody in the audience? If, well, okay, yes, and then I have one more from online, but and then we'll wrap it up within five minutes. Mr. Sharma, uh, I'm Mr. Sharma. Actually, we uh, enable the e-government services in Andhra Pradesh. So I would like to know from you, the people with a lot of experience and other things, are there any shared infrastructural services in terms of enabling citizen services, at least one or two good practices? Shall I repeat my question? Are there any cases or examples in terms of shared infrastructural services in terms of capacity building to raise and enable e-government services? Do you mean shared infrastructure in terms of capacity building Absolutely. or of access infrastructure? Yes. I think the UN has tried over the years to, to, to facilitate that and, and would have in Geneva, for example, also in New York, capacity building efforts where different UN agencies might collaborate. Um, and, and I think at a regional level, you might have some um, a regional uh, um, government, um, like economic unions, for example, trying to do that. But I don't think it, it does happen um, very effectively. Uh, so I think it is a, it, it's, it's, it, it's related to this lack of continuity with approaches to capacity building and also lack of a holistic approach to capacity building. So often, um, and I think that's a role that the IGF can, can play. So I think your point is very relevant. And I think if the IB, IGF can become a space where you do stock taking about capaci cap capacity building, maybe a space where you can create common entry points about information about capacity building, um, that can possibly stimulate an environment of more shared infrastructure, shared resources. Thank you very much, Henriette. Uh, to close out, um, we have more brain teasers being sent to us by Professor Nelson in Washington. And I'll simply read these and see if anybody has anything uh, quick on them, and then we'll, we'll let everybody go. Um, 
He asks, uh, in my class on internet governance, we examined a case study of how users forced Facebook to radically change its beacon service. Users complaints and petitions forced Facebook to revise its business plan. What can be done there if you can relate it to my first question about uh, bottom up and uh, uh, so on. And then he also sent an, th another message saying, what if developing country users could organize online like LinkedIn.org has in the U.S.? Do any of these questions uh, spark any particular sentiment uh, from anyone on the panel? Um, okay, I feel like that. I'm speaking too much. I think I think we've talked about it. I think it's Mawaki's point, the point that Mawaki made about about user power and about whether users in developing countries are consumers as opposed to developers. And um, so I think there are ways of doing it. I think. Um, access again, I think open source actually, and, and, and open source as a governance issue can be a way of creating more capacity um, at the user level to ship um, platforms and ensure that they are, are rights oriented. So um, I think there are multiple ways, and I think we've probably touched on, on many of them already. Okay, um, I want to thank all of you for participating in this uh, afternoon uh, session. Um, I think we've uh, touched on some very interesting points and I think it's clear that there's a, a consensus that however we do it, uh, more space has to be made within the IGF and within internet governance discussions generally to uh, take on the real development issues, not just the sort of uh, political uh, dimensions, the geopolitics that Fiona referred to at the outset, but really getting drilling down to asking how do these things actually affect a people-centered, bottom-up, empowering development uh, for everyone. Um, there's clearly some very meaty questions there that require a lot more analysis uh, and action going forward, and I think we've We've laid some basis for doing that. We've also heard uh, a, a, another wonderful suggestion that the United States should have an internet governance forum. I would, I would be very interested in that myself. Um, so listen, thank you all. And uh, uh, we have two people waving at us. What does that mean? You're just waving or? <laughs> oh, well, a sudden question before we go? Okay, well, the, quickly, uh, because I'm about to con conclude. Yes. Please do it. Okay, actually, it was Elena's question, but she asked me to, <laughs> to <laughs> identify to yourself, Ralph. Uh, Ralf Bendrath, uh, Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands, but I'm a German, actually. Um, what is going to happen on this subject between now and the next IGF? <laughs> Much cogitation, dialogue amongst interested parties, and continuing. Where, when, how can get people involved in that? Well, uh, anybody who's interested in continuing this conversation uh, can in particular simply give me their business card. And should we in the future decide that we do want to proceed with a dynamic coalition or something like that, that we had about 60 people in Rio say that they would be interested, but we just didn't have the momentum at that point. But should we decide to do that, then people could certainly uh, participate in that. So if you are interested in continuing a, a discussion on this point, feel free to just come up and give me your business card and uh, I'll be in touch with you. Thank you for reminding me. Can I make a proposal, Bill? Well, Bill needs sure. a secretary, preferably a male one, because a female one would be gender discrimination. Mm -hmm. But I suggest that at the next May Information Society Week in Geneva, it's not an ideal location, but many of us do manage to make it to Geneva for the IGF consultations, that we actually convene our, our first planning meeting about how to take it um, forward. And I think another way of doing this would be to bring a lot of the research that's happening, for example, work that you are doing and that others are doing, and bringing that into a common space and maybe, and Bill also wanted to produce a book, which is, which is another idea. But let's make that a milestone. That's my proposal. Well, that's uh, a good idea, and thank you for prompting me. And certainly, the May is far enough out to actually contemplate uh, getting a room reserved either in the UN or at my institute, whichever. So I'm more than willing to uh, try to figure out how to make that happen, and we'll be in dialogue on, on that very point. So thanks again for poking me, uh, Elena and Ralph, and thanks to all of you for participating in this discussion.